Okay, so welcome back to another episode of the Locker Room Podcast. Um, I'm delighted today to uh, to have a very special guest on, not only a legendary player uh, for many clubs and also uh, a well-esteemed coach, but someone that I've managed to work with for a number of years now very closely. Um, not only at the top of his game as a professional, but probably the nicest man in football. I'm not sure he's ever heard me say that before. So, Paul Furlon, uh, Furs, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for coming on. Not a problem, Ross. Thank you very much. You're welcome. I'm, I'm excited to chat a few things around development and, and get a little grips on maybe stuff I haven't heard before in your career as well. Yeah. Um, just before we start, I just want to say a big thank you to our uh, sponsors. So www.ripped.app, uh, an online platform that does uh, training sessions, can uh, give programs to clients, can monitor monitor their workload all remotely online. Um, it's a very good tool that we started using at Daily Sports Science. So if you head over to the website, dailysportscience.com, you'll be able to see uh, an offer for two months free. And again, you can program for teams, you can program for athletes, um, and you can get feedback and get some dialogue on there. So check that out over on the, uh, on the website. And thank you for your continued support with the guys, Cormac and the guys. So first, I thought it'd be good to start off. Obviously, I know you as, as more of a, on the coaching side, but maybe just delving a little bit into your playing career. Um, so maybe just give the listeners a little bit of a brief history of who you played for, how you got into the game, um, and just kind of bring us up to the end of your playing career, if that's all right. Yeah, no, fine, Ross. Um, well, firstly, Ross, thank you for having me. Um, glad to be on the show. Um, and welcome and hello to all the, the listeners out there. Um, for me... Um, my footballing career, I mean, when, when I was a kid growing up at school, um, I always uh, kind of knew I was perhaps a little bit ahead of the other boys within the team, within the, 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 the groups I was playing with, but never really thought it was a, a potential pres um, profession for me, you know. It wasn't until I started to play uh, some Sunday football and got a bit older, got sort of 16, 17 years of age, where I started to um, attract a bit of attention. Um, I then played for Enfield Town. Uh, back in the day, it was a, a, a well-known non-league football team. Um, we played in an FA Cup tie. We played Cardiff, uh, I believe, at home. Uh, we, no, we played Leighton Orient at home and then Leighton Orient away. And I think that was the platform that pushed me into professional football. Um, I had a good game. I played well. I believe I scored as well in, in, the, in the games over the two legs. Uh, and I remember the coach at the time, who was um, assistant to the coach at Leighton Orient at the time, he moved on, went to Coventry City um, with Terry Butcher uh, and then recommended that, you know, he signed me. So I remember it was funny um, as a 22 year old, yeah, 22 year old, I was uh, playing for Renfield Town. Um, I was made redundant. I was working for a company by the name of Thorny MI who made light bulbs and light fittings and stuff. Um, I got made redundant from there. So I was at Enfield at the time and the manager, uh, Peter Taylor, was a good friend of Stevie Perriman, who used to play, ex they're both experts, football players. Um, and Steve Perriman was manager at Watford. So he said, you know, the man fact you're not working at the moment. Why don't you go down there and train with Watford and see how you get on? So it was, a, it was like a gimme really, do you know what I mean? Something I wanted to always get involved in. Um, so I thought I'd go down there and give it a shot. Uh, come to the end of the week and they were thoroughly uh, impressed at what they saw and they wanted to sign me. So i never forget that on the Friday, Stevie Perriman brought me into the, to the office and said, listen, uh, we're going away for the weekend. We're on a bit of a tour over the weekend. Uh, and on a Monday, we're looking to sign you. We'd like to, you to come back in and we're going to offer you something. Um, so I was, I was obviously delighted with that. Uh, it wasn't a club too far from where I lived. But I went home on the Friday evening. It's funny, I got a call from Terry Butcher at Coventry. So back then it was the, the old Division 1, which was the Premier League. So it was Division 1, 2, 3 and 4. And Coventry City at that time were in the top league, Division 1. So Terry Butcher rings me up and says he would like to have a word with me regarding potentially coming to the club. Uh, I went down there over the weekend and I believe on the Monday I signed for Coventry. So uh, I know Watford at the time wasn't too happy with that. But I mean, you know, sometimes these sort of things happen in football. So then, yeah, my first encounter was playing at Division One for Coventry City. Um, then I went on, um, I played there for a year. There was a couple of changes of managers. Then I left there and funny enough, where did I go back to? I went to Watford. 
Spent two years at Watford, and that's where I really learnt my trade under the likes of um, Kenny Jacket, Glenn Roder, and even Speed Steve Perryman were, the, were, the, were there. So for me, Kenny Jacket was a, a big part of my my career, my early career in terms of professional football, playing centre forward, uh, the different runs you've got to make, closing down, making play predictable, all the things that you need to be a good centre forward. I learned, I would have said, under Kenny Jacket, um, and you know, I believe he's still coaching now. But I thought his information was spot on. It wasn't like rocket science, like sometimes you can speak to some coaches and they can sort of bamboos you with words and you, you come out more confused than when you went in. I thought he was very clear and concise in the way he uh, spoke to players. And I learned lots from him. Um, then I moved from there. I was fortunate enough. I spent a couple of years there. I moved from there um, and then got a move to Chelsea. Um, so I played at Chelsea for two years. I mean, it was a, a dream come true, really, to play for a London club, being a London boy myself. Uh, so I had some good times there, met some very good people um, and played at some fantastic grounds. Um, spent a couple of years there and then um, the likes of um, uh, Desai, Gianfranco Zola, these boys started to get introduced into the club. I had two years left of my contract at the time and I, I really wasn't interested at, at that stage of my career to be playing reserve team football. I mean, I had the option to stay there, had two years left of my contract. But I thought, no, I want to go out and play first team football. I want to really make a name for myself. Uh, and then Trevor Francis at Birmingham City, he came in for me and I went to Birmingham. Uh, and I had about six good seasons there. Very big club, um, always had expectations, always knocking on the door of, of perhaps promote, getting promotion and going into the Premier League. Never quite happened. I mean, we had the likes of um, um, Steve Bruce, Mike Newell, uh, play, people that have played at the top level. So, you know, on paper, um, the team looked very strong, but unfortunately, we never really managed to get to the heights that I think was predicted of us. Uh, I left there, came back to London again for QPR. Again, had a fantastic time here. Um, spent about five seasons here, um, getting promotion uh, to the championship with them. Had a great time working under the manager, Ian Holloway. Um, and then, yeah, left, left there. And then really after that, I went to South End. I went to uh, Barnet, Luton, and knocked around a little bit after that. Um, and it's funny enough, I wasn't really, you know, thinking about coaching. As long as I was playing, I wasn't really, never really had my mind on coaching. I mean, people used to say to me, like, what are you going to do when you finish playing? And I used to just like joke and say, oh, I'll take up fishing. Do you know what I mean? But, you know, as a footballer, when you're retired, it's like you're a long time retired. So, you know, there's a lot of life left in you when you finish playing football. So my son, uh, my eldest son, he started uh, in the academy system here at QPR as an under 11 uh, and I remember coming to watch him, um, watch him play and I started to do a little bit of non-league football as well, playing for St Albans, then a little bit at Kettering, I was player coach at Kettering um, but that was, you know, obviously definitely coming towards him in my career and it was then time for me to then to start to think about life after football um, and I remember my son being here as I said and um, I remember Steve Gallen was head of the academy at the time and he spoke about coming in and helping out and helping be a coach, you know, passing on some of the knowledge. And I really wasn't, um, didn't really want to do it. I was quite happy to watch my son. I was happy to get in, you know, be in the background, just watching my son improve, you know. And he asked me two or three times. Um, and what happened was my son, uh, before coming to QPR, he was um, playing for a local grassroots team, uh, Edmonton All-Stars they were. And I never forget the one day the coach never turned up. Um, so the parents were kind of, as, you, as they would, looking over their shoulder, looking at me, were thinking, hang on a minute, you played a bit of football. How about you doing training? So I took the training session. And, you know, from that day, um, I thought, yes, this is something I really want to do. I want to sort of like pass on the experience I've got to the younger players. Uh, and, and that's where my coaching started to develop. So then um, I spoke to Steve. Steve got me in at QPR, started to work with the under 13s, then progressed to the 15s. And now... You know, for uh, that's this, this is my seventh season I've been working with the under-18s and thoroughly enjoy it, you know. I mean, I was just speaking to someone the other day and um, I was just saying to them, you know, uh, they were saying to me, do I want to do first team? And yeah, I do want to at some stage um, dip my toe in at first team football to see what that's like and experience that. But I really am um, I mean, pleased and I get a lot of reward and um, out of under-18s coaching. I've been doing it long enough now where... I've seen players progress from my group into the 23s, into the first team, 
or progress and play in the first team somewhere here, so somewhere else. So it has been really rewarding. Um, but in terms of do I want to coach a first team? Yeah, I do want to coach a first team. But I am really enjoying uh, what I do and the staff that I work around and the players that I work with uh, make it enjoyable. Thanks, for Loads of experiences there to draw upon and talk about. Um, you spoke about Kenny Jackett having quite a big influence on your coaching. Was there any other managers and coaches who you played under who you maybe took a lot from? Maybe you didn't realise at the time, but now you might think, well, actually, the way they did that, I quite like that, or yeah. that was quite good. Yeah. Um, I would have to say, so I, I mentioned Kenny Jackett in terms of his, you know, spending time with me on the training, going after training. Glenn Hoddle was another one as well who spent time with me training after, uh, after sessions, little finishing sessions, working on my first touch, working on playing with my back to play, stuff like that. Ian Holloway was a great uh, motivator. So could give you, could enthuse you, enthusi give you enthusiasm with the way that he spoke to you. So there's been a lot. I mean, John Gregory, I played for when I was coming towards my end of my uh, coaching career. Uh, and although I, I, I wasn't happy at some of the decisions he made, I look back at it now as a coach and I think, you know, I took, I took similarities that he has and it's applied it to myself. He was very uh, particular in terms of how the cones were set out, how the, 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 the training ground, the environment, how it looked, very smart, very tidy, very punctual, you know? Um, because, the, you know, the odd time as a player, I was I could roll up a little bit late sometimes and, and I was punished for it, you know. But I can see, you know, the standards in which he was trying to set, how he was trying to cr create the environment, um, being tidy and everything being spot on, you know. Um, so, yeah, so there's a lot of managers where I take bits and pieces from, whether at the time I thought they didn't agree with me. But as I now go into my coaching career, you know, especially John Gregory, I think, you know, there's lots of, I, you know, of, the, of his traits that I try to, in late, you know, into my career as a coach. I can definitely vouch for a particular nature in terms of setting things up first. You're, you're, you like it a certain way. You like the white cones and 10 yards. Yeah, that's, 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 right. that's quite a thing for your session, I think, which is that's good. Right. Yeah, yes. Going back to the Chelsea first, you obviously had some big names, which you mentioned there. Um, what was that like? And, you know, playing with such prestigious players and of that ilk, some skillful players, foreign players that come over to here. Did yeah. you learn a lot from that group of players as well as the management? I did, yeah. I mean, first and foremost, um, I got signed for £2.3 million. I think it was a, a record at the time for a centre forward. I mean, it's like, you know, it's peanuts in today's terms, but back then it was, it was good money, you know. Uh, and, that come, and with that comes pressure. Uh, you know, the club are spending that amount of money on you. You've got to be producing the goods. You've got to be trying to hit the ground running. Um, so, but I try to, I try to really take it in my stride in terms of that side of things. But in terms of the players I played with, yeah, I played with internationals: Dennis Wise, um, Mark Steen, uh, Frank Sinclair, Erlen Johnson, Dimitri Karin. Do you know what I mean John uh, uh, Steve Stephen Spence, Steve Spencer? Yeah, I'm trying to remember all the names there now. <laughs> but I played with a, a, a lot of. Um, players who have got a lot, a lot of experience, you know, and I learned loads. And, you know, for me, you know, and I even got the same attitude in my coaching, you know, that I always want to raise the ceiling. I always want to improve myself all the time. I never think that I'm set and I'm complete and that's it. So I'm no different as a player, as I am a coach, as a player, always wanted to, always wanted to learn, always wanted to ask questions, even speak, even speaking to defenders. Like when I go here, what's it, what does it feel like for you? Is it uncomfortable? Do you like to go in these areas of the pitch? always trying to gain an upper hand, you know? So it's the same with a coach. Always try to watch coaching sessions. We've got a fantastic coach um, and he's my boss here, Chris Ramsey, who I learn loads off of. And I'm, you know, my mind, I have a growth mindset and I want to learn all the time. Oh, that's great to hear, Furs. Furs, so the listeners, are, the majority of listeners will be coaches across a whole different range of sports. Um, obviously, you're the lead under-18 coach and you've been here now for, what's your role, four or five years? Six? I, I think I've been doing this for about six, seven years now. Six, seven years. Yes. Very, very experienced in the role and, and doing great things here at QPR. What could you tell people what like a typical day is like for your role? So when you come in, what's a typical day look like in your position? Yeah, for me, so I normally uh, rock up about half past eight in the morning. Um, and then the, for me, the, 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 the day starts from there. You know, I start to uh, plan the session. Uh, what do I want from the session? Uh, I put it down on paper. Uh, and then at about 9.30, we have a, a, an NDT meeting. So we all get together. And, and then obviously yourself and the physio team, they can tell me the players that are available, the players that perhaps you need to be mindful of. 
uh, and then I start to collect my numbers. So then that's when the detail of exactly what passing practice, what possession practice I'm going to be put in. Um, and, you know, as, as our program is a very individual based, I mean, you know, it's a lot of the stuff we do is for the individual because we believe that, you know, you never ever take the whole team through to the next level. It's individuals within the team that go through to the next level. So, and then, so the training session will start about half past 10. We'll train for an hour to two hours and then we'll come back in and then we'll, as, at times as coaches, we'll talk about the session, what went well, what, how could we have improved? I've got to input the session on the, uh, we have a PMA system, uh, uh, a management system where we have to input the, the games and the training times for the players. So over the course of the season, we can collate information to find out how long they've trained, what they've done in training, et cetera. And then, you know, uh, again, in the, in the afternoon, we're then talking about um, the session and perhaps what the session might look like tomorrow, who done well in the session, et cetera, et cetera. And then on the odd time of a week, I'm out there training with the under 16s in the evening, you know, so it, they, they can be long days, but enjoyable days. For sure. And you said about the MDT meeting first, what sort of things do you look for within your multiple disciplinary team, whether it's the medical department, analysts, sports scientists, whatever, and how, how does that look like here and, and how do you work together? Yeah. Also for me, the MDT meeting, so you, the people like yourself, the S&C team, the medical team, I mean, everybody associated with under 18 staff uh, are, are able to attend the meeting. And we just, you know, I, I mean, the floor is open to, to all the members of staff. I mean, think there may be things that I've not noticed or Micah Hyde, the assistant, has not noticed. So the, all, all the ideas and, and et cetera, et cetera, go into the pot. And then we obviously talk about stuff, you know. But, you know, for, for me, I might say to you, Ross, s and um, you know, for instance, we might have a centre back and he's good at heading the ball or but he's not the quickest on the turn. So speed on the turn, another big one for full backs and centre backs. So I'll say to you, Ross, how can we improve his speed on the turn? And then you'll put in some exercises, et cetera, to help with his speed on the turn. Um, another one, centre backs, I know that you do quite a lot, is a foot patterns before, you know, uh, before training. So as they can move their feet, they're not too wooden and they have flexibility within their movement. I think we do that quite well. Then I'll speak to the, the, the physio team about, players how are the players feeling how you know because sometimes the players will come to me i'll ask the players how they're doing sometimes the players will come to me and they say oh i'm fine first you know what i mean and they're saying that to me because they know more often i'm picking a team and they want to be playing and then the physio then answers them and then they give them the physio a different answer i will feel a little bit stiff etc etc so it's important that the physios are obviously in that room there so we can get a feel of how the players are feeling any players who may have slight niggles that we might need to might need to be mindful of uh, and, and anything like that. Then we have also the video analysis in there as well. Max comes in there as well with us. Uh, and any little bit of footage that he's seen in training, he might say to me, come and have a look, at, look, a look, little look at this. That's something I've not quite spotted, you know? So I think we all get together. And I think, you know, I really do believe that we have a good team here. Um, we've shown that by the productivity rate that we've got through and are playing in the first team already. So I think we really will, really will work well together, you know, as a group. For sure, Furs. Um, you spoke a little bit about the session when you spoke about the passing practice possession, but what does, obviously dependent on the day and, and how hard you want to work the players, but what does a typical session look like at QPR? Yeah, I mean, for us, we start off and we work on total control. So it's normally one ball between two. We're serving it off of the thigh, off of the outside of the foot, off of the knee, chest, off the head. And then we go into our 75 passing. So it's like 25 on the left, 25 on the right, and then we alternate for 25, you know? And then there's a different series of passing that we go through, which we call the 70s, 75s. So we work on the 50s, which is playing with the outside of the foot. So one team will, one, one of the pairs will serve with the instep, the other one will play with the outside of the foot. Then we have the 40s, where both of the pairs are working. You're working about sort of eight yards, six to eight yards distance. So we're controlling with the instep of one foot, playing back with the in, outside of the other foot. Then we work on the 30s using the same foot so the ball is played into you. You take it across the body with the incep and play with the outside of the uh, outside of foot to your teammate. Then we work on the 20s, which is you're about sort of 10 yards apart. We're now punching the pass in with a bit more weight. So the whole idea of the receiving skill is to control with the instep of one foot and punch the pass back with the instep of the other. So by that first touch that comes in with you, we like it, we like it, we're calling that a, a dead touch. We're trying to control that ball in an era just in front of you where you can come on and play the second one without, you know, somebody coming to nick the ball off of you. And then we work on the tens, the little reverse passes, playing with a lot of disguise. So the ball comes into me, I take it slightly off the line and I'm reverse passing the ball into my teammate. 
So we work on those. And then we tend to go into <clears throat> like a passing and receiving practice. Okay, again, working on our touch and short range passing. And then we're uh, more often than not going to a possession practice, whether it be little uh, small sided possession boxes, 4v1s, 3v1s, or work on a hit the blue um, swarm game. Hit the blue is like, you know, 4v4 plus two floating players, uh, one team keeping possession. And, uh, and the other team, when they get possession, they're looking to play off of the two blues all the time. A massive part of the way that we want to play where we try and get the two, uh, two blues within the possession practice, they are more often not our midfield players. Because in terms of the way that we want to play, we want to try and open up teams by going through the centre of the pitch uh, and then working the ball out wide. And then we'll go into like a small-sided game. Um, and then at the end, which is a big part of what we do... Um, the boys work on their individual learning plans. Everybody's got an individual learning plan. And at the end of the session, they have time in which to work on their game. As I said at the start of, the, of this little bit here is that um, it's very individual based our program. Uh, so, you know, we do like to, the boys to spend time on working on their own individual bits. So, for example, a wide person who, you know, uh, more often not in their games, they're going to be wanting to cross balls all the time. So we try to set that up. If you're a centre back, you're going to be working lots on your heading, a lot on your, your first touch, driving into space and then punching passes, you know. So the area in, in which you play on the pitch, we try to sort of bring it down to its micro form and then work on those areas of the game. And would you say first that links into their job essentials then of what they need to do for their job? 100%, 100%. You know, I mean, like, listen, we're not going to, for instance, we could have, a, you know, over the past, I've had centre-backs who are good at dribbling the ball. So they're good at driving out with the ball, uh, which is a good thing. But for me, it's like more of a desirable. I'm saying, can he 1v1 defend? Can he head the ball? Do you know what I mean? Those are the things, you know, that as a centre-back, those are the things that we need to be covering, you know, which needs to be paramount. The other little bits, they're nice to have, but then there's certain criteria that people in different positions will need to have in order to uh, have a career in the game. For sure, Fers. You spoke a lot about the, the passing range that they do and, and the unopposed passing work. There's some arguments out there to say that the unopposed passing work is limited because there's not so much decision-making. What's your thought process as a player as well in terms of finishing and repetition stuff you did yeah. and coaching? What do you feel on the repetition side of things that are unopposed and, and you're just getting repetitions in of certain skills? Yeah, yeah. Uh, for me... Um, I, 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 I'm heavily for that, if I'm perfectly honest. Um, I mean, you know, you can watch any game of football and the amount of times it breaks down on a five-yard or a ten-yard ten pass, you know. So I, I believe that the players need to be good at the basics before we can then go on and then really be productive in a team environment, you know. I mean, I think if you miss out the repetitions, I think you might fall short when it comes to the games, you know. So I think if the repetitions are good and we can get the mechanics of that, spot on, then I think the transition from that into the real thing, the game, becomes so much more easier. For sure. Good, good answer. Well, I think, I think similar as well, and I think we're in agreement here, but there are lots of other different thought processes out there. Um, being a former player first, has that helped you, has that helped you as a coach? Maybe opportunity to, to become a coach, an opportunity to be in the position you're in, but also as you're in your role, do you think that really did help you and, and start to form an idea of what you wanted to do and how you set your set yourself up? I think so. Um, uh, as, a, as a player, I mean, first and foremost, I think, you know, once you've, whatever environment you go into, if you, whatever you, you, you're in, whether you have been a plumber or an electrician for 10, 20 years, and then you then go on to work with younger uh, apprentices who want to become what you come, I think you get instant respect. Why? Because you've been doing it for a long time, you know? So I think that's kind of helped me as well in terms of the, the, the knowledge and, uh, that I've gained, the people that I've worked with, the people that I've played with, I think it's put me in good stead, you know? Um, I do believe that, obviously, it, it, it was a, a different... I had to change the mindset from a professional footballer to now a developer of players. There, there's a complete difference. So, obviously, as a professional football player, you're preparing for the game. The game is the be all and end all. It's about getting three points on a Saturday afternoon. Whereas with the, the youth with the youth team and developing players, we're almost, I'm not saying that we um, we don't want to win football matches, but that's not the be all and end all in terms of a player development. Okay. So for me, it's about developing the individual, uh, giving the individual the tools to be able to play in any system, any style of football, giving them the tools, whether it be the short range, long range, the heading, 1v1 defending, getting the body shape right, etc. Giving them the tools to play in any system. And for me, I think 
the, the, the knowledge that I've picked up over the years, I think um, in terms of player development, I think meeting um, Chris Ramsey has been a massive part of my learning uh, and, 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 and remains so. It still continues to be the way in terms of player developing, you know. So, I mean, you know, I mean, the, obviously he's worked at Tottenham for years and, you know, the players that have come through under his tenure at, at, at Tottenham is quite remarkable, you know, and even here at QPR as well, you know. So he sort of transformed the way I thought about football in terms of the de development side. Um, and I, I remember when I first came in and we was trying to, you know, we there were scenarios we were putting on, we were trying to play it from the back and the players couldn't get it and we were losing quite heavily at times. And I remember Chris coming and saying, well, it might happen. You might lose heavily at times, you know what I mean? But we need to maintain it. We need to put the boys under pressure. For example, if we're trying to play it from the back, we need to put the centre-backs under pressure. They need to feel experience being under pressure and trying to find a way out, obviously using different members of the team and creating triangles and diamonds, you know? So, uh, so definitely me being a player uh, and, and you know, the people that I played with and the manager I worked under has most definitely helped me in terms of where I am today. Do you think that's something that coaches and maybe other clubs and organisations get hit up on about the result and not wanting to lose and maybe that changes the way they play? Do you think that's a common thing? I think I, I think it's there. I want. To, I'm not too sure about common. I think it's there, um, but you know, I'm not. To, you know, I'm not saying here that what you know what we do is the the, the be all and end all. You know, play. There are other teams out there that we play against, and we know that when we play, it's a different mentality that they have, and it's about winning. You can see that, but they produce players as well. So it all depends on your style, your, your the philosophy, what you want to do in terms of how you do, how you uh, develop your players. But I do believe that with us, we're quite flexible, uh, and the players learn to play a style of football. So I believe that it's it's quite easy to get it and just kick the ball long. So if you're going to be a long ball team, it's quite easier to do that as it is to be able to try and play through the thirds of the pitch. For sure. I'm even thinking of other sports firms outside of football that maybe have got a culture of wanting to the under eights to win the, the league and just yeah. thinking about what is it that's going to actually help them to get onto the best that they can achieve as opposed yeah. to just winning that game. Yeah. Um, you spoke quite a bit about Chris Ramsey and, and his influence. Speak a little bit about maybe you spoke a little bit about your philosophy, but is there any overarching like things you have as part of your philosophy as developing players that might be on and off the pitch? And has that changed across the years first from when you first started at all? Um, yeah, most definitely. I would say over the last sort of maybe three years, um, working w working on a player in isolation, I think has been a big one for me. So you can do you can put on practices, and within the practice, players can get what they need from the practice. But I do believe that sometimes you have to take players away from the group. And as I said, work in isolation, really try to break down the, the mechanics of their role within the team. And that's something I've took on board quite a lot recently. And not only that, but showing the boys footage, um, bringing the boys to one side, having one on one set. And we do quite a lot of that as well as part of our, uh, our weekly schedule where we plan a Saturday, the boys do their clips on huddle. And on a Monday, we go through them individually because sometimes you'll get boys that within a group, I mean, we do do a performance uh, video analysis sessions as a group, but sometimes within that group, you may lose certain people within that group. But when you work on them individually, it's amazing what the, what feedback you get from the players when you work. So for me, I would say working in isolation, individual practices, taking players to one side, and also video analysis sessions, I think has been a big thing for me over the last sort of three years. And for me, I believe has been a great accelerator in terms of learning. Perfect, first. First, have players changed over the last X amount? I mean, from when you were playing, probably definitely, but also even since you started coaching, has the type of player changed and, and how you have to manage and interact with these players now? Do you find that, do you find, sometimes see yourself looking back and thinking, yeah, I have to act in a different way to get the best out of these players now? That's right, yeah. Well, I mean, back in the day, you'd get like, you know what I mean? You'd be told, roll your sleeves up and just get on with it. Regardless of what was going on, you just, just roll your sleeves up and get on it. And that's how it was back then. Yeah. It's a little bit different. So when I first came into this, obviously it was a little bit different. But I just think that um, there's so much, um, I don't know, there's so much help that the players have now. Do you know what I mean? That we're almost, I don't know, at times, are the players too soft? Are they, you know, because what we really want, we want people who can problem solve. And as a player myself and as a kid growing up, that's what I had to do. We had to problem solve. So I remember as a youngster, when I used to play, sometimes I'm playing against the bigger boys. 
So, you know, a couple of times as a centre forward, you get the ball played up and you haven't checked your shoulder and you just try and turn, you're going to get a clump off of one of the bigger boys. So soon you learn very quickly to perhaps come off the defender and, you know, play with a bit more intelligence. I think, I think nowadays the players, are, as I said, they have so much uh, going their way that they don't even realise how good they've got it. So in terms of psychological help, uh, medical help, um, S&C, football coaching, there's so much help that they have at, the, at their disposal. And I think sometimes when you have it like that, they almost disregard what they have, you know? Um, it's almost like they have to come away from it to realise bloody hell how good they actually had it then, you know? So I think there's been a massive change. Uh, um, but I think the help is good. I think in right, used in the right way, I think the help is very good. I remember when I was uh, back playing, I suppose, there were times where I was having bad games and all that, and there was not really anybody that, I could really go. There wasn't a, a a sports psychologist that I could go to and sit down and 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 uh, with, would would I wanted to go to one? Probably not, to be perfectly honest, because I wasn't brought up that way. It was a case of having to roll this sleeve up and just keep going, you know. But so I think there's a uh, there is a, a massive difference between the players when I was playing, when I first started playing, and the players now. Do you think there's something? In that, that we've, we've lost something across the way that is stopping players from problem solving, being able to maybe train when they're feeling a little bit sore, whereas now they're a bit more heightened about their, you know, how they're feeling stuff. Is there, is there something we've lost along the way? Like, is there some stuff we could have took from I, then? I think so. I think so. I mean, I, I'm just picturing in my mind, uh, I remember Stephen Gerrard when he went in at Liverpool with, working with the under-18s. And he was saying that, you know, these players, these players have to play with little niggles every now and again. Because I think the football that the academy promotes, it's getting the ball down. It's all nice, isn't it? It's all nice and uh, an attractive football. But sometimes are we, sometimes are we preparing them for the real life outside of football? Which is why I think within academy football, and I know some clubs do it already because I speak to a few coaches, where we organise these games against um, grassroots, non-league teams, older teams. So we get a different test. So it's not the same thing week in, week out where we're playing pretty attractive football. Sometimes you might get a kick. Sometimes a pitch might not be as nice as you're, as you're accustomed to. Setting them up. Because, you know, when you look at the group, I mean, you know, we have 24, 25 scholars. How many of those are going to go through and play football, you know? But there'll be a lot of them that will go through, I'm sure, and have the ability to play non-league or, or, or play some level of football, you know? So I think it's important as us as coaches and as, as, as academies that we try to set them up so they become in, uh, in a better position or give them the tools, let's just say, to play at different levels within, within the sport. Sure, I totally agree, Fez. I think the games programme could be one of that, um, a massive influence on that, isn't it? As well as the way maybe you, you set up certain situations around the building. Yes. Um, yeah. First, just talking a little bit about, you've seen lots of players come through. Um, I mean, we have to reference your son. You said your oldest son, Darnell, who got sold for a good fee to, to West Brom, is now playing in the Prem. So massive credit to him and you as a part of his journey as well, personally and professionally. Is there some real common... Um, characteristics that you see in these players that are making it to the top and like be becoming, you know, a living, uh, playing football for a living, I guess. Yeah, for me, there's a common theme and it's not rocket science or anything. For me, it's hard work. It's hard work, dedication, um, listening is a massive thing. So for me, uh, I mean, I've worked with players, uh, I'm not going to really mention their names at the moment, but, you know, players who could decide whether, you know, when they cross the white line, so crossing the white line, going onto the pitch, that was work time. And then when they came off of the pitch, that was time to have your laugh and your jokes and stuff. Um, for me, I think dedication, hard work and practice is, is, is a common theme that I see in the players that have gone on and done well. People who don't moan, they just get on with it, get on with it, you know. Sometimes it can be, you know, for me as a player, and, and I know some of the players that I've worked with that have gone through, you know, they're able to look at themselves. So they're not blaming other people. They're able to look at themselves first without pointing the blame at somebody else, you know? So to put it into a nutshell, I'll say hard work, dedication, and someone who's prepared to ask questions, do you know what I mean? Is, 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 is a common theme I think I've found with the players that have gone on and been successful. For sure, and sometimes that, that, even though that's the minimum you ask of players, that's not enough sometimes, but it gives you the best chance, doesn't it? Exactly, yeah, you're right, Ross. I mean, sometimes that's not enough, do you know what I mean? But that will give you a, 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 good, a good base in which to, to work from. For sure, Furs. Furs, I know uh, we're prepping for the game tomorrow, chopping away, so I'm not going to keep you too much longer, but just a couple of things, if that's yeah. okay. Um, 
what's I know you mentioned about dipping your toe in, in first team football potentially, but for Paul Furlong, what is maybe the end game? Where would you like to see yourself as ultimate dream job and and what do you see yourself doing long term? Yeah. Um for me, I mean I had when I was I'd like to get into first team football at some stage. I'd like to give that a go, give that a try, you know. I was unfortunate when I was at Barnet. Um I was obviously I was 42, 41, 42 years of age, believe it or not, and still running around scoring goals in League Two, you know. Um, and Ian Hendon was the manager at the time, um, and he said to me, you know, I, I was there for a season with him. He said to me that, you know, so, sort of back end of the season, I was doing a bit of sort of after training, I was taking the centre forward to one side and doing a bit of work with them, you know, just working on their game, working on their turns, working on their finishing. And he said to me, like, you know. It, you know, next season, if I'm still here, I'll get you on as part of staff, you know, so I'll become a first team member of staff. Um, uh, that never materialised. I mean, he moved on to other things uh, and that never materialised for me. And that, you know, I, I look at it back now and I thought perhaps then if that, if I had an opportunity to step in there, it might have set me on the road to more of first team, you know, working within a first team environment. Um, but yeah, I mean, at some stage, obviously, I do want to work at first team. Um, I think initially, I, I feel fit, I feel strong. I, there's lots of enthusiasm in me, so I feel to coach at first team level, I, I would be really happy with that. And then moving on further from that, then you know, when I think to myself, like, sub going out on a on a cold, wet morning, do you know what I mean? Then I might take up a manager's role, you know. But, uh, <laughs> I think so. The end game, the end game, could be a manager's role, you know, on the side of the pitch with collar and tie. That could be the end game. But I think there's another step before getting to that one. For sure. But first, knowing you, I don't think you'd want to sit back in the canteen and let training go. I think you'd want to be on the grass all the time yeah, unless things yeah. change massively. You're probably um, right. You're probably right. Do you think that change in... So obviously, you didn't get that first team role, though, and you spoke about your experience as an academy role. Do you think, though, having coming back and now coach for seven, eight years in an academy role and learning under different people, that's now like set you up better? You're now in a better position with maybe greater coaching knowledge and experience to step into that first team environment? 100%. Yeah, I mean, obviously, along the coaching journey, I've made mistakes. Uh, every, I suppose everybody makes mistakes in sessions and planning of sessions. So I've made my mistakes and I like to think that I'm a little bit more rounded now, you know, so um, I can deal with different scenarios that pop up. Um, I can see different things happening on, on the pitch and stop it and then recorrect it. So I think, you know, uh, I remember when I first started uh, doing my coaching badges and um, I remember one of the coach educators said that, you know, this coaching thing will change your life. Do you know what I mean? And I believe it has changed my life. I mean, there's, I'm, I'm working long hours, you know, uh, and the wife isn't too happy at times with it. Do you know what I mean? But I'm working long hours because I never forget when I was a player, she, you know, coming towards the end, 41, 42, she's saying any chance, you know what I mean? Are you going to finish now so we get more time together? Do you know what I mean? So it just so happens I finish, I'm coaching and we're even less together, you know, we're obviously because of the hours now, I now work, you know? So, uh, but yeah, so, you know, it's a, uh, it's an enjoyable time. Uh, and yeah, in terms of first team football, that's something I'd like to get myself in at some stage. I'm sure people will be watching out for your career first to see where you go. When, when the, the move gets announced on Sky Sports, they'll be, they'll be looking out. Um, just to finish off then, Furs, is there any, again, we've got coaches from all different sports. Is there any advice you would give to coaches? Uh, there's some, you know, higher level, there's some at grassroots. Is there any advice you would give to these coaches around it could be anything around setting up training sessions, setting up teams or just general advice um, yeah. just to finish off. Yeah, for me, it's just a case of, you know, and I adopt, as I said, I spoke about it earlier on in this interview that, you know, as a player and as a coach, I adopt the same mentality in terms of wanting to learn, you know. So for me, I like to go and watch training sessions. I like to go and watch games. I like to speak to coaches who have coached at a slightly higher level than me, you know, always trying to, you know, get, seek out information to try, just to try and better myself and not, have this ceiling, you know, where that's as much as I'm going to learn as, as, as and, and, you know, take on board. Always try to push the, the, the ceiling. So for me, always being open, open up to learning and having the growth mindset. I think that's great advice first. First, thank you so much for your time. I know you're a busy man planning and getting a team ready for tomorrow. So really appreciate that. Thank you very much. Um, it's been a pleasure to have you on and a pleasure to work with you over the last like five, six years. So yeah. thank you very much for that. Ross, thank you very much indeed. Thanks for having me on. Cheers, Furs. And just for the listeners, guys, um, just head over to the website, check out what we got on offer. We've got a buddy referral scheme coming up, which is very, very exciting. And we've also got a coaches off-season CPD that you can check out on the website as well. Uh, massive shout out to our sponsors, Ripped, um, who has continued to sponsor us. So we, we welcome 
we welcome all their sponsorship and their support for the podcast. Um, thank you for listening. We'll look forward to seeing you next week on Locker Room Podcast. Thanks, guys.